win. Win. Almighty. Almighty. Strong. Strong. South wind. South wind. Heat. Heat. Burn this thing. Burn this thing. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Satan, you bow your knee. Satan, you bow your knee. You fall on your face. You fall on your face. COVID-19. COVID-19. I blow the wind of God. The wind of God. On you. On you. You are destroyed forever. You are, you are destroyed, destroyed forever. And you will never be back. And, and you'll, you'll never, never be back. back. Are you serious? This is horrific. This is demonic. Something demonic's going on. Hi. My name is Jack Rackham, and today I'm going to show you the family tree of Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States and one of the most controversial political figures in the world today. I'll be tracing his paternal line back to its roots in Germany, looking at how his father and grandfather amassed their wealth. He was born in the small town of Karlstadt in what is today Germany to a family of wine growers. You may have heard that this man's last name was actually Drumpf, especially if you're a fan of late-night show host John Oliver. This theory is now under scrutiny, as the connection is unclear. But in any case, his name derives from the word trumpet, which in turn comes from the word triumph. And now the word trump has come to mean one-upping. Johann Trump is also the great-grandfather of Henry J. Hines, founder of the famous ketchup company, through his daughter Charlotte, who married Johann Hines. Skipping a couple of generations, we come to Friedrich Trump, who is Donald's grandfather and second cousin to the Heinz founder. He came to New York when he was just 16 to escape military duty in Germany in 1885. He worked there as a barber for several years before moving to Seattle in 1891. There, he led a tumultuous but very lucrative career. He bought a restaurant in Seattle, which also served as an illegal brothel, and then he got involved in funding mining operations. This eventually took him to Canada during the Klondike Gold Rush, where he continued to run restaurants and brothels. The government eventually cracked down on prostitution, gambling, and liquor in 1901, and so he left, having already made a small fortune. He returned to Germany very briefly, where he met and proposed to his wife. But by 1902, the two of them were back in New York. And then in 1904, they moved back to Germany on account of his wife's homesickness. But the German officials pieced together that Friedrich had originally left the country to evade military service, and so he and his family were banished from the country. All in all, through his various business ventures, including some real estate, he had amassed a net worth of around half a million of today's dollars when he died in 1918 due to a respiratory illness caused by a rampant pandemic, the Spanish flu. He was succeeded by his wife Elizabeth, who grew her late husband's real estate business in a massive way under the name E. Trump and & Son, and remained involved in the business until her death in 1966. That son was Fred Trump, who was only 13 when his father died, hence Elizabeth's name being used for the company. When he grew up, he married a Scottish-born woman named Mary Ann McLeod. By the time the Second World War began, anti-German sentiment was at an all-time high in America, so Fred began telling people he was actually from Swedish descent. That cover story carried over until the 80s and 90s, repeated by his son Donald Trump, though he now admits his paternal line does, in fact, come from Germany. As a landlord, Fred Trump's business dealings often came under scrutiny. In the public eye, Woody Guthrie wrote an unreleased song about him called Old Man Trump, but he also fell under the scrutiny of the government on many occasions. He was investigated for profiteering, code violations, and racial discrimination. A number of people working for him came forward saying they were told discrimination was against the law, but nevertheless they were told, quote, not to rent to blacks. What's more, it's likely that Fred Trump was at one point a member of the Ku Klux Klan, based on his arrest at a 1927 Klan rally. Parent. President-elect Donald Trump says Exxon Mobil chairman and CEO will be his Secretary of State. Mr. Trump announced this morning that he will nominate Rex Tillerson as the country's next top diplomat. Donald Trump decided to nominate the Swamp for Treasury Secretary. <laughs>
He went with a guy named Steve Mnuchin. Mnuchin is a second generation Goldman Sachs partner. Haha, <laughs> double swamp for you. And what the whole game was, was to get us to accept their agenda yet again. But Christians were out celebrating. God has answered our prayers. Really? You know this for a fact. The Holy Spirit has spoken clearly in your heart that this is in answer to your prayers. I got some person sent me a message last night. Is, God, is Donald Trump God's man to bring revival? That was on the back of another question. Is Donald Trump the Antichrist? Well, what are we going to do? This country's going down the tube. No, it isn't. I mean, we could have another eight years of Hillary Clinton and the worst mess that anybody could make out of a nation. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is God's nation, and nobody is going to take it away from him. Mr. Trump, he says that he was a Presbyterian. Uh, if you look at who his pastor was, it was Norman Vincent Peale. When you look at Norman Vincent Peale and what he taught, uh, you, you'll find that it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, true Orthodox Christianity. And I, whether or not Trump is complicit with uh, spreading that particular philosophy of the po power of positive thinking and all that, uh, which is actually uh, comes out of Freemasonry, you, when you look at his philosophical bent and how he speaks and what he does, it doesn't line up with biblical Christianity. It does line up with power positive thinking. It, it's, it's actually very amoral. I like to work where I don't really have to ask for I like to do the right thing where I don't have to actually ask for forgiveness. Does that make sense to you? You know, where you don't make such bad things that you don't have to ask for forgiveness. I mean, I try and lead a life where I don't have to ask God for forgiveness. Mr. Trump sounds like a conservative, but he has casinos in his portfolio, <laughs> you know. And did you, did you say that there could potentially be a link to the Frankist agenda and ideology within him? Yeah, absolutely. Either if Trump is not a part of that group, then he is being played. Or he may, I don't, I, I can't say uh, what the man's motivation truly is. I really don't know. But he is surrounding himself with people that are linked to a Frankist ideology. Uh, Jacobian, uh, you know, going back to Zabatai V, uh, he is surrounding himself with people that their ultimate goal is complete eradication of all things biblical, in essence in order to bring about the one world government, which is the, the charter of the United Nations. And if you actually look at be, what's behind that philosophy, go into the writings of Alice A. Bailey, it's the ushering in of their cosmic Christ, who the Bible calls the Antichrist or the beast, or the coming world ruler, the Assyrian. Their ideology is you have to make every person on the planet wicked or you have to make them all righteous. Since it's impossible to make every man righteous, it's going to be a lot easier to make every man wicked. Let's go down the wicked route. And that's what the United Nations is based on. It's a total eradication of anything that's of a biblical nature. This by very definition is a wolf. If, you know, if that's the case, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's very anti-Christian. These people, for those listening, are enemies of the church this ideology yeah it's well it's not so much enemies of the church because the church is corrupted in many ways as well the organized churches uh you're going to find this power of positive thinking taught within almost every single church in the united states unfortunately it's it's integrated into most denominations in the world this this concept uh the the main the main thing is there is a reduction on the focus of becoming sanctified, but an increase on let's build our positive uh, self-image.
that's the biggest problem that we're seeing in the church is that this is going this feeds into where in the bible does the bible teach that the governments of the world will be controlled and ruled by born again believers if you can show me one scripture where in scripture does it say that the church will gain such influence that we will rule the world do not put your trust in princes nor in a son of man in whom there is no help maybe this is a sign of the falling away that these characters can rise on the scene in such a big way and fool so many within organized religion and churches that um it's become like a beacon of deception well yeah absolutely deception is the main sign of the end of time at the end of time as we know it i should say before christ returns the disciples asked him what are the signs of your return and what's the very first thing he says do not be deceived <laughs> we have to worry about work wolves and sheep's clothing in our own personal lives but when trump comes on the scene uh and speaks a, a really i mean very good rhetoric I mean, if you listen to what he says in his speeches, it resonates. It sounds wonderful. It's very positive. You're going to think very positive, but you're going to forget. He, when you start to look at what he actually does, does it actually line up with Scripture? And so far, it doesn't. Itching is, and it really concerns me. Just, just as an example, as a test run, there, just how many people who are Christians flock to it and. What's it going to be like in the future? Because I'm sure this antichrist figure is not going to be speaking hate, what, what seems like hate. They're going to be saying things that are very swelling and very alluring and interesting and it's going to grab people's attention. Well, yeah, it, the antichrist is not going to come across as, uh, you know, a big giant, you know, leather wing demon. No, he's going to... Anti doesn't mean against Christ necessarily. It means in place of. He's going to come in, in, in Alice A. Bailey's writings, he's going to be Christ, uh, the ascended master. He's going to come across as someone that everybody in the world will fall down and worship unless you have a saving faith in Christ. And even Christians might be deceived. There's a uh, book of Revelation promises that you will be rounded up uh, and executed. So our leaders are not our salvation. Only ultimately Jesus is our salvation. We can't assume that just because we're praying for our leaders and just because they have good rhetoric that they're going to be on our side. Yeah, and ultimately the promises I find comfort in mainly is just that all of this is working together for uh, the heavenly promise and hope that we actually have that our, our hope isn't in this world. We're of a different kingdom, citizens of a different kingdom, so. And that's, that's one of the biggest lies that we have today is this whole concept of, you know, being positive and trying to build our, our little bubbles of security on this planet and trying to uh, assume that everything, you know, we just be good, be, uh, you know, positive, be conservative and all that. And that's all that, that matters. In reality, no, we need to be preparing to meet Jesus face to face. And we need to be preparing others to do the same. There's going to be massive deception. And unless you can discern truth from deception, we, we Christians may fall for it. And if somebody like Trump can come on the scene and you're thinking that he's all that and a bag of chips, well, wait till you, the real thing comes on the scene. I'm look. I mean, ultimately, I'm looking forward to just this whole storm that we're going to have to go through potentially. That the separation of the sheep and goats, and all that all that we're told in the Bible is just these things are tools that are being used to refine us and prepare us for a, a place with eternal consequences. And and that's the most amazing thing ever. That the hope that lies underneath all of this, all of these coming things. Listen up! There is a storm coming! Like nothing you have ever seen! And not a one of you is prepared for it.
Everyone's going to have to chip in. That's only fair. That's the principle I'll be fighting for during the next phase of this process. One issue that has come up is once you do have a, a vaccine, how do you properly distrib distribute it? Uh, how do you get it out quickly? To well, when we have the vaccine, we have the military all lined up, and the military is going to be doing it uh, in a very uh, powerful manner. Uh, these are people that don't usually do vaccines. They do soldiers, and they do lots of other things that, frankly, are more difficult. But we have uh, our general, and uh, logistically, he's all set. Uh, Tony, do you want to say something about that? That is correct. Um, as the vaccine rolls out, we'll be getting them distributed. And as uh, you probably have heard, we are going to make sure that we do it in an equitable way, and it's representative of the populations who need it the most. And we have the, t the standard way that we determine that with the ACIP working with the CDC, but Dr. Uh, Collins and Dr. Redfield have put together with the National Academy of Medicine uh, a, a group that will fortify that decision-making process so that we're making sure that we're very fair and equitable in getting the vaccine distributed properly. And I think I could have Francis say that the tremendous progress has been made on the vaccine beyond anything that we would have thought if you go back six months. Uh, what do you think? Uh, it is just, frankly, quite astounding, Mr. President. I've been at NIH for 27 years and director for 11, and I've seen some amazing things happen. But the way in which the whole research community, public and private, you know, philanthropies, everybody has come together to work on this, not worrying about who gets the credit, just trying to figure out how to strip away anything that's going to slow things down. Uh, and I think all of us motivated by the fact that this is the most serious problem we've encountered in our professional lifetimes, even a day uh, matters. And so that's why a lot of people look kind of sleepy because we're all working 24-7 trying to make sure that nothing uh, possibly uh, slows this process down. Yeah, the vaccines this week is a big week, as you just heard, having two phase three trials started in the very same day uh, this past Monday. And uh, based upon very impressive phase one data showing that people who got that in the phase one trials developed these high levels of neutralizing antibodies that should be very predictive. Uh, of protection, but you don't know until you actually run the trial in those 30,000 people. By the way, you, you heard earlier about coronavirus.gov, which is the place you can go to to find out how you can donate plasma. There's another thing you can do if you go to that website, which is to sign up to say you're interested in a vaccine trial. And we need people to volunteer for that as well, because we're going to, with these four or five uh, trials coming along very quickly, each of which needs 30,000 volunteers, that's a lot of people, and we need them. And, Francis, we're working very well with other countries. We well, are indeed. And science has always been international, and it certainly is right now. And we work with our colleagues in Europe and the U.K. and Asia uh, in a way that I think represents the best of the best. And, again, everybody recognizes we're all in this together across the whole planet. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another.